Welcome to the Northbound Wealth Podcast. All opinions expressed by me, my co-hosts, or my guests are solely our own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Northbound Wealth Management. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended as personalized recommendations or fiduciary advice. It is not intended to provide and should not be relied upon for any investment, accounting, legal, and tax advice or as a solicitation to offer or buy any securities. Clients of Northbound Wealth Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello, everyone. This is July 4th, 2023. It's been a few weeks since I last posted a podcast to uh, Apple and Spotify, but uh, it was all for good reason. I've been working on getting Indie Pod Lab up and running along with a couple of partners, uh, Matt Zappazzotti, as well as Tom Marquell. So we are very close to launching out. So stay tuned for uh, having our podcast uh, here of Northbound Wealth Management in the studio of Indie Pod Lab. So we'll be excited about that. All right, here we go. Without further ado, let's dive into the weekly market insights. The economy continues an upward trend. Uh, stocks posted gains for the week to close out a stellar month at, a, aided uh, by positive economic data and reports that all major banks had passed the Federal Reserve's annual stress tests. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 2.02%, while the S&P 500 rose 2.35%. The NASDAQ Composite Index added 2.19%. The MSCI EFA Index, which tracks developed overseas stock markets, increased by 0.76%. So what does that mean for the Dow? The Dow closed last week at 34,407. Year to date, that's up 3.80%. The NASDAQ closed at 13,787. That closed at 31.73% for the year. MSCI EFA index closed at 2113. That's up 8.73% for the year. The S&P 500 closed last week at 4,450. Uh, That's year-to-date up 15.91%. The 10-year Treasury note closed at 3.81%. Year-to-date, that's up basically 0.07% flat on the year. Stocks climb as recession fears ease. So investors shrugged off weekend news of a short-lived insurrection in Russia and calls later in the week for more restrictive monetary policies from global central bankers. What powered early week gains? Good question. New home sales, durable goods, orders, and a rise in consumer confidence proved influential. More so were Thursday's reports of a drop in initial jobless claims, an upward revision in the first quarter GDP growth, which helped ally recession fears. The results of the Fed's annual bank stress test, which all major banks passed, further emboldened investors. Stock prices rallied Friday following an encouraging inflation report capping an end to a solid week, month, and first half of 2023. And by the way, on that note, I just released this week the Northbound Wealth 2023 halftime report. So check that out on YouTube and then also be looking in your inboxes if you're a client to and on social media uh, for that update. It's about 30 minutes. I go over four key areas. Uh, You'll want to check that out um, as it's being released this week in waves. All right. So global central bankers meet at last week's European Central Bank Forum. Central bank governors from around the world gathered to discuss their monetary outlook and the policies needed to manage inflation amid unexpected economic growth. Fed Chair Powell reiterated that more rate hikes were coming owing to a robust labor market. He added that he wouldn't dismiss the idea of hiking rates at consecutive FOMC meetings. While saying there is a possibility of an economic downturn, Powell didn't believe it was the most likely case. Meanwhile, bankers from the ECB and the UK echoed Powell's comments declaring that further rate hikes are needed to tame their still elevated inflation rates. This week, key economic data. So the PMI Manufacturing Index, Institutes for Supply Chain Manager ISM surveys are being released on Monday, Wednesday, factory orders, FOMC minutes, 
which we're all paying attention to. Thursday, uh, ADP Employment Report, Jobless Claims, Institute for Supply Chain Management uh, Services Index, Purchasing Managers Index, or PMI Composite. We're all focused on that one. That one will be an important one. And then the JOLTS survey or job openings and turnovers. So we're going to pay attention to that Thursday. Friday, employment situation updates. All right. This week, uh, notable companies reporting earnings. We've got Seven and I Holdings and Levi Strauss. Next week is the big week, kicking off earnings, starting with all the major banks. And uh, I'll be paying attention to their guidance and their reporting. Tax tip. Can you claim the child care tax credit for other dependents? Um, even though you may not be able to claim the child tax credit, you may be able to claim the credit for other dependents under your care. The IRS issues a max of $500 for each dependent who meets specific conditions. These conditions include dependents who are 17 or older on December 31st of the tax year, dependents who have individual tax identification numbers, dependents living with the taxpayer for more than six months of the year. Remember the special rules for divorced and separated parents or parents who live apart. The credit begins to phase out when the taxpayer's income exceeds $200,000 a year. This phase out begins for married couples filing a joint tax return at $400,000 a year. This information is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized tax advice. We suggest you discuss your specific tax issues with a qualified tax professional. All right. Uh, stay tuned for the next segment. We've got a lot of really good information in this 45th episode of the Northbound Wealth Podcast, so stay tuned. So MFS Investment Management compiles data from around the United States, and then they post it every week, and they send it to people like me um, who subscribe to it. And I find it very interesting. It's called By the Numbers or, by, or Beyond the News. Excuse me. By the Numbers, Beyond the News. And so this data is really good. So the American Association of Individual Investors, which I've quoted before on our podcast, said bullish sentiment uh, was up through June 26, 2023 by 40%. Uh, so that's interesting, and it's reflective in the equity markets as well. So bullish sentiment heating up. Individual investor bullish sentiment exceeded 40% in the week ending 621.23 for the third week in a row. The last time bullish sentiment exceeded 40% for the three or more weeks was in July of 2021. Even with the elevated sentiment, bullish sentiment what has not cracked above 50% for 113 consecutive weeks. That's notable. So new economy beats old economy through uh, almost the end of June. The NASDAQ was up nearly like 35% year to date versus a gain of 2.4% for the Dow, 33 percentage points spread between these two large cap U.S. equity indi indices is easily the widest uh, through the first 117 trading days of any year since the NASDAQ began trading in 1985. And that source was from Bestoke. Um, <clears throat> week finish into halftime. So halftime would be at the end of June. So since 1945, the S and P 500's medium performance in the last week of June has been a decline of 0.14% with gains of just 40% of the time. Uh, in the 24 years where the S and P 500 was up 10% plus year to date, as it was this year, the median decline during the last week of June was 0.39% with gains of just 46% of the time. And that source was from Bespoke as well. Um, a source of Credit Karma in recent survey, 33% uh, of Americans say they knew the net worth of one or more celebrities. And among younger Gen Z Americans, the percentage was even higher at 64%. Despite knowing the net worth of celebrities, more than half, 51%, reported that they had no idea how to calculate their own net worth. Fascinating. <laughs> Jeez. Talk to us if you don't know how to do it. Uh, surge in housing starts. U.S. housing starts surged 21.7% on a month-over-month -month basis in May, the largest monthly increase since October 2016, and just the seventh increase of 20% or more dating back to 1989, one year after each of the previous six 20% plus monthly increases, the S&P 500 Home Builder Index was up every time for a median gain of 36%. And that source is from the Census Bureau. Uh, 
Uh, National Association of Realtors says trapped in low rate mortgages. You're darn right. If you bought a house before 2019 and have a loan, you're likely in a three to four percent range or maybe even better. Over the last 12 months, average monthly annualized sales of existing homes have been 4.46 million, the lowest level since August 2012. Supply remains the main culprit as inventories of homes listed for sale fell to 1.08 million, which is the lowest level for the month of May since <laughs> at least 1999. God, these are, man, it's crazy times we live in, leading to a recession. So the conference board uh, index of leading indicators declined in May for the 14th straight month. Since 1959, the current period ranks as the third longest streak of monthly declines and just the fourth streak lasting a year or more. Of the three prior periods, the economy was already in a recession by the time the streak reached its 12th month. <laughs> there you go. Talked about that before as well. Let's see. Record inversion pace. So Bespoke has some data here through uh, the end of June, basically, the 10-year uh, three month US Treasury yield curve has been inverted, which is 10 year yield lower than three month yield for 154 trading days dating back to November 2022. Since 1962, the longest streak with an inverted 10 year three month curve was 209 trading days ending in May of 2008. To break that record, the curve would only need to stay inverted through mid September of this year. And by the way, it's still inverted. They're trying to not have it be inverted, but it still is. Um, no time to plan. So Charles Schwab says 65% of Americans surveyed in the Charles Schwab's 2023 Modern Wealth Survey said that they do not have a formal financial plan. Of those without a plan, 21% said it was because it seemed too complicated and 20% said it was uh, too time consuming. Yeah, it takes some effort to make a plan, doesn't it? And uh, we're happy to do that for you and with you to create a financial plan so you can be one of the, the unique ones that says, yes, I have a written plan. Let's see, uh, U.S. Department of Labor and data from Bespoke. Jobless claims surge. Jobless claims are up 45% from their lows, but the latest weeks, which was this is kind of mid-level June data, uh, reading of 264,000 is still extremely low by historical standards. Since 2016, the median weekly level of initial jobless claims have been 235,000, but in the 1,878 weeks recorded from 1980 through 2015, there was just one week where claims came in below 260,000, and the median weekly reading over this period was 360,000. Let's see, big city blues. Uh, this is from Indeed, actually. Uh, job postings in the U.S. tracked daily by Indeed are down 21% from all-time highs made on 1231 of 2021. Major cities with populations above 3 million have seen job postings fall the most at 25 plus percent, while metros with less than a million people have seen postings fall the least uh, at 17%. Interesting there. Welcome, North Carolina. So this is from the Duke Chronicle. Earlier this month, <clears throat> and this was in June, North Carolina became the 38th state to legalize sports betting and the 29th to allow mobile wagering. North Carolina will collect an 18% uh, tax on gross wagering revenues and use some of those proceeds to fund gambling, addiction, education, and treatment programs, as well as collegiate athletic departments and other youth sports programs across the state. That, that wraps it up for Beyond the News by the Numbers MFS Investment Management. Uh, really appreciate them uh, summarizing a lot of interesting data across the street and providing that to us so that I thought I'd share it with you. On to the next segment. Hey, this is Brent Foster, and I want to talk about uh, what the Daily Upside sent out. Today, it's about white-collar woes. So you guys might be wondering, what the heck is that? Uh, let's see. We are in a recession, if you ask high-earning Americans. It's a quandary worth of Shakespeare. Are we or are we not in a recession? The answer, it turns out, may depend 
on your tax bracket. The unemployment rate still hovers around historic lows. Inflation is finally falling and GDP keeps ticking up. But for high earning Americans, fresh off a couple of rollicking pandemic years, it's beginning to feel a bit more like a recession, according to recent analysis by the Wall Street Journal. Down and out in the metropolitan and union clubs. Oh, how the tables have slightly turned. Thanks to the tight labor market, wage growth among lower paid and less educated laborers has finally outstripped that of their higher paid, higher educated counterparts after four decades of increasing wage inequity or inequality. According to a recent research paper published by the National Bureau of Economic Research, that dovetails with Labor Department data that shows that recent wage growth among the highest earners in the bottom 10% has surpassed the rate of inflation, while those in the 90th percentile have seen wages fall behind rising prices. Meanwhile, ritzy jobs in the New York City securities industry saw a sizable 26% haircut to typical end-of-year bonuses in 2022, down to just $176,700, according to state-level data. And it's not just income where society's upper crust, or at least uh, the lowest rungs of the upper crust, are feeling the sting. There's a reason why newspaper business sections feature seemingly contradictory headlines about both historically low unemployment rates and massive waves of high-profile layoffs. Roughly one-third of layoffs announced by American companies this year have stemmed from technology or the tech sector. Meta, for example, where the median salary is nearly $300,000, has cut thousands of employees so far this year. Wall Street has uh, been far from immune to layoffs this year as well. Meanwhile, Bank of America Institute economists say that the number of households earning at least $125,000 receiving unemployment benefits was up 40% in April compared to a year before, a spike five times that of households earning less than $50,000. And that's only the 30 states in which laid off workers receive benefits via direct deposit. A list of states that crucially doesn't include California and its ailing tech hub. The downturn has led unsurprisingly to some belt tightening. The Bank of American Institute uh, of Economists also found that discretionary credit and debit card spending dipped in April year over year for high income households, even though it increased for most other households. Of course, surely you've shed a crocodile tear or two by this point. High earning Americans will likely be okay, even if they're increasingly living paycheck to paycheck. But in California, home to an outsized share of the nation's homeless population, loss of a job or income was listed as the leading cause for homelessness and a new comprehensive study from the researchers of the University of California. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, the homeless capital of the nation, rates soared roughly 10% last year, according to a recent annual report. Brian Boyle wrote that piece. Very, very, very good stuff. And here is another bit that I thought I'd cover, which is a little more social in nature. The FTC closes in on influencers. So, Uh, The FTC is the Federal Trade Commission. Being your hashtag best self isn't as profitable when you have a big watermark splashed over your perfect hashtag no filter face. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission updated its guidelines on how influencers and celebrities, honestly, is there even a difference between them anymore, endorse products on social media. Basically, a barely visible hashtag ad in the text beneath the an Instagram post isn't going to cut it anymore. The circle of influence titans. So it's hard to estimate exactly how big the influencer marketing industry is because who exactly constitutes an influencer is pretty fuzzy. Influence, let's see, influencer marketing hub estimates that the sector was worth about $16.4 billion in 2022, as did McKinsey which is a consulting uh, analytical firm, influencers or creators, other uh, 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 influencers or creators, another flavor of influencer that generates more original content uh, can make more money directly from the various platforms they work on, like YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, all have programs that let creators profit off the companies directly, but endorsements are where the serious money lies. According to McKenzie, the consulting firm, uh, talking about even relatively obscure influencers can bag a five-figure payday 
for a single post and celebrities can go higher than six figures. The FTC isn't looking to limit influencers' pay with its new rules. It just wants them to be a bit more explicit about the fact that they're getting paid to gush about those new sneakers they just, quote, bought, end quote. Influencers won't be allowed to use disclosures uh, anywhere that where there's a chance an idly doom scrolling user might not see them, which in essence means they'll have to place their disclosures on their actual videos. That could put a slight damper on influencers' whole vibe, but it's also a warning to brands that might want to get some of the 21st century shilling done. I think that the whole influencer endorser landscape or environment and every party involved in it is on notice now, said, quote, Allison Fitzpatrick, a partner at law firm Davis Gilbert, told the Wall Street Journal. So there's red tape everywhere. Uh, new disclosure requirements are also making life miserable for Meta, which suffered another uh, setback on Tuesday when the EU decreed that Facebook will need to ask users permission before showing them personalized ads. Mind you, judging by how much attention European web and I'd say American web users pay to the cookie permission pop-ups, they endlessly have to click through. It might not change their habits that much. Uh, Isabel Hamilton wrote that one, and I thought it was worth a uh, share with you guys. There's been over 2 million copies of this book sold. It's a best-selling book by Morgan Housel. It's called The Psychology of Money. Timeless Lessons on Wealth, Greed, and Happiness. And uh, Jason Zweig of the Wall Street Journal says it's one of the best and most original finance books in years. And I agree. I'm going to read uh, an excerpt out of chapter one, No One's Crazy. Your personal experiences with money make up maybe point, oh, I don't know, one trillionth of 1% of what's happened in the world, but maybe 80% of how you think the world works. Let me tell you a problem. It might make you feel better about what you do with your money and less judgmental about what others do with theirs. People do some crazy things with money, but no one is crazy. Here's the thing. People from different generations raised by different parents who earned different incomes and held different values in different parts of the world born into different economies, experiencing different job markets with different incentives and different degrees of luck, learn very different lessons. Everyone has their own unique experience with how the world works. And what you've experienced is more compelling than what you've learned secondhand. So all of us, you, me, everyone, go through life anchored to a set of views about how money works that vary wildly from person to person. What seems crazy to you might make sense to me. The person who grew up in poverty thinks about risk and reward in ways that a child of a wealthy banker cannot fathom, even if he tried. The person who grew up when inflation was high and experienced something the person who grew up with stable prices never had to. The stockbroker who lost everything during the Great Depression experienced something the tech worker ba basking in the glory of the late 1990s can't imagine. The Australian who hasn't seen a recession in 30 years has experienced something no American ever has. On, on and on, the list of experiences is endless. You know stuff about money that I don't and vice versa. You go through life with different beliefs, goals, forecasts than I do. That's not because one of us is smarter than the other or has better information. It's because we've had different lives shaped by different and equally persuasive experiences. Your personal experiences with money maybe make up one trillionth of 1% of what's happened in the world, but maybe 80% of how you think the world works. So equally smart people can disagree about how and why recessions happen, how you should invest your money, what you should prioritize, how much risk you should take on, and so on and so on. In, this, in his book, The 1930s America, Frederick Lewis Allen wrote that the Great Depression marked millions of Americans inwardly for the rest of their lives. But there was a range of experiences. 25 years later, as he was running for president, John F. Kennedy was asked by a reporter what he remembered from the Depression. He remarked, quote, I have no firsthand knowledge of the Depression. My family had one of the great fortunes of the world, and it was worth more than ever then. We had bigger houses, more servants. We traveled more. About the only thing that I saw directly was when my father hired some extra gardeners just to give them a job so they could eat. 
I really did not learn about the depression until I read about it at Harvard. End quote. This was a major point in the 1960 election. How people thought could someone with no understanding of the biggest economic story of the last generation be put in charge of the economy? It was in many ways overcome only by JFK's experience in World War II. That was the other most widespread emotional experience of the previous generation and something his primary opponent, Hubert Humphrey, didn't have. The challenge for us is that no amount of studying or open-mindedness can genuinely recreate the power of fear and uncertainty. I can read about what it was like to lose everything during the Great Depression, but I don't have the emotional scars of those who actually experienced it. And the person who lived through it can't fathom why someone like me could come across as complacent about things like owning stocks. We see the world through a different lens. Spreadsheets can model the historic frequency of big stock market declines, but they can't model the feeling of coming home, looking at your kids and wondering if you've made a mistake that will impact their lives. Studying history makes you feel like you understand something, but until you've lived through it and personally felt its consequences, you may not understand it enough to change your behavior. We all think we know how the world works, but we've all only experienced a tiny sliver of it. As an investor, Michael Batnick says, some lessons have to be experienced before they can be understood. All are victims in different ways to that truth. I agree with that. Um, this excerpt, the, the, the chapter goes on, and I'm going to continue to drop some of these excerpts or, uh, from the psychology of money. Um, Michael Housel's book, it is really, really good. And I'm just like maybe partway through, and I'm already like, these are... <laughs> These are timeless uh, truths about human behavior, and uh, I'm excited about pulling some of these excerpts and sharing it with you guys on on the weekly basis, maybe over the next 17 weeks or so. So um, hopefully you glean something from that and on to the next segment. So I came across this article. It was, it's entitled, Finance is the Number One Industry Gen Z Wants to Work In, Says New Research More Than Tech or Healthcare. Published Wednesday, uh, June 28th, updated uh, here at the latter parts of July by Morgan Smith. And this is on CNBC's Make It uh, site. It's interesting. Um, uh, here we go. Recent and soon-to-be college graduates have different visions of their perfect job. Some want to work in New York, while others might aspire to be their own bosses. But many Gen Zers are dreaming of a career in finance. Finance is considered to be the most desirable, stable sector to work in among 18 to 25-year-olds, beating out tech and healthcare and education, according to a new report from the CFA Institute, a nonprofit focused on financial education. Close to 10,000 current college students and recent graduates in 13 uh, countries, including the US, Canada, and Mexico, were polled for the report. The, the survey results are a stark contrast to those in 2021 when finance was ranked fifth in popularity among college students and recent graduates behind the same industries as well as business. To be sure, finance has not been immune to the challenges that have afflicted tech, healthcare, education, and other industries, including, but not limited to, overhiring, employee burnout, and battles over returning to the office. What has set finance apart from its competitors and made it the career path du jour among Gen Zers is how finance companies have responded to these challenges. As other industries pause hiring, college career advisors and industry professionals say financial firms are upping their recruiting efforts on college campuses to attract Gen Zers. And uh, basically, they're targeting campuses where tech has left them behind. Uh, AJ Ehrenstein has been counseling college students on their careers for 15 years. In 2023, he says, has been the worst year for rescinded job offers in tech that he has ever seen. Financial firms seeing the chance to hire engineers, developers, and data scientists are scooping up the talent unlocked by layoffs and hiring freezes in Silicon Valley. These companies are approaching us and asking for opportunities to be present on campuses to recruit business and computer science majors, says Aaron Steen, who is now the assistant vice president of a lifelong success at Bernard College. Uh, quote, he says they're investing more time and money on campuses and showing a clear interest in widening their talent pools and pipelines when other companies have pulled back. 
So it's an opportunity for financial firms to pick up good talent. There's been a consistent uh, increase in the number of graduates working in finance between 2020 and 2022. 13% of graduates in the class of 2020 entered the finance field, while 18% of the class uh, found jobs in finance. Uh, Ehrenstein expects this number to be even higher as for the class of 2023. Financial firms are facing a more competitive market for talent than they were 10 years ago when they almost always had the first pick of hiring graduates from top colleges and universities, says Rotary uh, priests, senior head of research at the CFA Institute. One way they're setting themselves a party uh, ads is by being the most visible on campuses. Larger companies like JP Morgan Chase and Fidelity Investments are hosting more online job fairs and on campus recruiting events compared to years past, says Christine Cruz Varaga. Cruz Varaga, Chief Education uh, Strategy Officer at Handshake, a networking platform serving more than 13 million college students. Their efforts are paying off. Handshake has seen uh, an increase of 26% in applications to full-time finance jobs uh, this year compared to 2022. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase received over 8,000 applications alone on Handshake from tech majors since the start of 2023, a 74% increase in the number of applications from tech talent last year. Um, let's see, promises of stability and a six-figure paycheck. Driven by inflation and concerns around layoffs, Gen Zs, uh, they're prioritizing stable employment and salary over location and brand name in their job search. One of the main reasons they're showing less interest in working for tech companies, according to recent data from Handshake. Wall Street has been hit by layoffs and hiring freezes too, but it's worse in tech. Amazon, Meta, and other tech companies have cut nearly 200,000 jobs since October, more than twice as many in finance, Bloomberg reports. In a precious job market, Gen Zers are going where fewer roles are cut. Financial firms have existed uh, through a lot of ups and downs. Uh, they feel more secure to go out and work for a company that's been around 50 to 100 years versus a startup that didn't exist 10 years ago. Most of the popular careers among young professionals are those with high income potential. The CFA Institute found and entry-level salaries in finance have remained relatively high in recent years. Investment banking analysts at major firms can expect to make nearly 200000 in their first year out of college, CNBC has previously reported. Now, by the way, those are for the top uh, jobs. So 200 grand a year is not uh, typical in my opinion uh, for those jobs. Now, CFA Institute wise, if you have a CFA, then sure. But, uh, it's interesting that they're reporting such a high number. Even if, uh, some finance employers are falling short on their promises to offer flexible work option, Cruz Varaga says more young people are willing to trade in the freedom of working from home for job security and a solid salary. It might be a difficult trade-off to make, she adds, but you can't always get everything you want from a job on your list. So there you go. Uh, the headline grabbed my attention, thought I'd share it with you. I posted that to social media, but finance is the number one industry for Gen Zers who want to work. Uh, and uh, it's more than tech or healthcare. What say you? I'm interested to hear what your feedback is around that. Um, is that actually true? Or is that just a, a Wall Street article trying to get us to uh, focus on the wrong things? Anyway, um, I think finance in the industry is a good one to be in. Have a great week and we'll circle back next week. Be looking for the next release of the podcast. It'll be the 46th episode coming up. Have a great week. Talk to you soon.